good morning. Um, happy Thursday. Let's see here. So I don't want that there. Just as a little bit of review. We introduced the T distribution uh, last day. It was just on Tuesday, so we don't need too much review. Uh, but we introduced the T distribution, which is what we use to analyze one or two means. And so uh, we've only worked with one so far. Uh, and so, and kind of have a, a sneaky one today. Um, but um, we have an example to finish first. So we use the T distribution. to analyze means. So for one sample mean, which is what we have seen so far, the null hypothesis, so the type, right? Probably the hardest part is figuring out what type of question you have. And then once you've decided that, then that limits you on your formula sheet. And then you can't stray from there. Right, and so as long as you're consistent, uh, you'll be safe. Okay? And so one sample mean, the null hypothesis, has to be about the population mean, right, mu. And so we have to hypothesize about the population. You want to be careful because if you're hypothesizing about the sample, well, you have your entire sample. You know everything about your sample, and so you don't you don't want to know about your sample. You want to know about your population. And so mu is equal to mu naught, where of course we've seen this before in the uh, one sample proportion case where mu naught is the value I want to compare my uh, sample mean to. So here, where mu naught is the value we want to compare x bar to. Sorry, let me see here. Yeah. Your alternative hypothesis has to be how mu compares to mu naught, less than mu naught, greater than mu naught. Those are one-sided tests, right? And so, um, and then if you have a not equal to, it's a two-sided test, right? And so <laughs> your null hypothesis, that's your step one. And then in step two, we calculate a T. And so T is the test statistic. And for one sample mean, we have X bar minus mu naught or mu. Sometimes we don't write the, the, the naught uh, divided by S divided by root N. Yeah. That means that you need to have your sample mean, your sample standard deviation, and your sample size. So three pieces of information from the from the sample, and then some value you want to compare your x bar to, right? And then to find the p value, uh, the t distribution. relies on the degrees of freedom on the degrees of freedom I, for I forgot to put the sign up and so the degrees of freedom we're going to abbreviate df and for one sample mean for one sample mean the degrees of freedom is n minus one. <laughs> so it's just your sample size minus one. Yeah. Hey, my n disappeared there. Oh, thanks. Timbit delivery. How luxurious is that? Um. <laughs> we'll have a coffee break today.
<laughs> no, we won't. Um, JK, uh, <laughs> once we have our degrees of freedom, right, then we use the, the T table or we can use Excel, but uh, even though we're online and, and it would make sense to use Excel, uh, I, I only want to test you on the T table just because then it'll, um, I don't want to make you do Excel under pressure. I do want to give you the opportunity to uh, to use Excel if you want to. So I'm trying to figure out how to make that work on the test. But um, but as a default, just uh, be able to use the table. <clears throat> the table is, where did it go? Here. <clears throat> is this one here. So we have the T di distribution with some degrees of freedom. And then we established last day that, okay, if I have um, a non-exact degrees of freedom, so if the exact degrees of freedom are not on the table, then you have to round down, right? Otherwise, you're you're pretending to have a larger sample size than you actually do. And the problem with that is your, your estimates become more stable, right, as you increase your sample size. So if you claim to have a larger sample size than you actually do, uh, that's bad. Right, you're claiming to have more reliable estimates than you actually have. Okay, and so that's why you have to round down. Now, of course, if you're using software that's not an issue, then it just will take any degrees of freedom. But in the table, that's that's going to be a concern. So when using the table, when using the T table. If the exact degrees of freedom, if if the exact degrees of freedom are found, then you're you're fine. Uh, if the exact degrees of freedom is not listed, we must round down okay, to the nearest degrees of freedom. To the nearest degrees of freedom. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Once you have uh, your degrees of freedom, then you try to place the T that you calculated. Let's say we have 25 degrees of freedom for simplicity, right? I, I would use a ruler or something, otherwise you can go cross-eyed here trying to read this table. And so I would use a ruler or maybe another sheet of paper or something to uh, to make a straight line. And then uh, you drop the negative on your T, right? Because T is symmetric around zero, just like Z was. And then we try to place our T along this line. And then we can drop down and we can find what, let's say our, our T falls somewhere in here, then our P value, we find the range for our p-value in the exact same way that we did for z. So that's nice that we've had some practice with that already. Wait, uh, what the? I don't know. What that was okay. And we did an example uh, with the dissolved oxygen level in a stream, um, which. Took some time, right? <laughs> but that was last day. And then, um, call that the end of the review, we looked at the confidence interval, but what I told you to, or asked you to do, was to uh, have a look at that confidence interval example and try it on your own. And now a confidence interval for one sample mean looks like this. We have our point estimate, right, x bar, and then plus a little, minus a little, a little buffer here, uh, and we have a t star as opposed to a z star, but we already know how to find that because we, we talked about it last day. And then we have times s over root n. What's nice about means um, questions is that the standard error 
for x bar is the same regardless of if you have a confidence interval or a hypothesis test. And so that's really nice, especially later when we move into two independent sample means, then we're going to have information just like we did for two sample proportions. We have uh, sample information from each group. And so then the calculation gets a little bit bigger. Right? Okay, so <laughs> let's see here. Um, let's remind myself. I'll just bring this in here. Copy. Paste. Because I think I had some writing here. I'll delete that page before I post it. So recap of the example again. So business bankruptcies in Canada are monitored by <coughs> OSB. <coughs> and included in each report are the assets and liabilities the company declared at the time of the bankruptcy filing. And so uh, a study was done and is based on a random sample, a random sample, that's good, uh, of 75 reports, which tells me that we have a sample size of 75 uh, from the current year. The average debt, now remember, now we're trying to find clues in the questions and um, first fork in the road that we're facing is, is this a proportion question or is this a means question? Now, a means or an average question, right, will have the term mean or average have a good class. Um, in it, and a proportion question will have the term proportion somewhere in there, right? It's unavoidable. It just takes, takes some practice reading these questions to figure out um, where, where those words are. So the average debt, which is the liabilities minus the assets, which doesn't matter to us, but we have an average, a sample average of 92,172. And so our X bar is 92,172 with a standard deviation of $111,538. There. So our sample standard deviation S is $111,538. And we want to construct a 95% confidence interval for the average debt of these companies at the time of filing. So I'm going to add a page here. And I'm also going to delete this old page. There. Okay. So we have, we have all this information, right? We have X bar, I have S, and I have N, I did uh, breeze by T star there, um, because that's, that's what I need. And so the critical value is the only thing that I'm missing that I don't have from this question, but I have, I need a 95% confidence interval. And so, uh, using the T table with degrees of freedom equal to n minus one. As soon as you're going to use the t-table, uh, you need the degrees of freedom, of course, and anytime you use the t-distribution, you're going to need the degrees of freedom. Now, I like to just do the calculation um, just in one line. I know that's sloppy, but uh, I do it anyways. I have 74 degrees of freedom. Now, I know that that's not an exact value on the table, but I'll show you right here. Oh, and I guess I need the, uh, uh, need the top too, confidence level in this case. Uh, do, 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 of course, it keeps going. 
And you know what? Copy. And there, make it one thing. Because when I go to find 74, right, then I am looking here and I go from 60 to 80. My choice is going to be 60. Right. And so what I'm what I'm going to do in my written work and I for this test, you don't have to submit your written work. OK, but um, I, I encourage you to just so that I can look back and see and and maybe give you some part marks if there's if there's some follow through that you did that makes sense. Right. And so. Um, so I encourage you to you don't have to because sometimes I know that's stressful, um, but it's a it's a nice way of of kind of showing me your thought process and if there's anything i can give you marks for then i will and so here what you would do using the t table with 74 degrees of freedom but using degrees of freedom equal to 60 right that illustrates to me that you know to bump it down right so here T star for a 95% confidence interval. Hey, look at us go. An even two. Cool. Why is that cool? From the 68.95.99.7 rule, right? Turns out we were working at uh, 60 degrees of freedom on the T distribution. Uh, than for the 95%. We weren't. We were using the normal, but close enough. Uh, so, but using degrees of freedom equal to 60, uh, T star is 2.000. That's the critical value, right? So the questions often ask you for the critical value, and that's the critical value uh, for a 95% confidence interval. Now we have all the components that we need in order to uh, calculate the confidence interval. Now, calculating the confidence interval is only half the work, half the marks, right? And so let's calculate it. And then what do we have to do? We have to interpret it. Okay, on the test, there will be a, a text box where you type your interpretation. And I mark those afterwards, just like your conclusion for the hypothesis testing question. Okay, so there's a lot of marks that uh, that haven't been accounted for until I mark them. So x bar plus minus t star times s over root n. x bar, 92,172. Plus minus t star, which was 2.000. I include the zeros just to illustrate that I, I, I haven't rounded or anything. That that is the value that I want. I want just two. You don't have to, but it's just good practice. S we decided was one hundred eleven thousand five hundred thirty-eight, right? And so one hundred eleven thousand five hundred thirty-eight divided by the square root of n, which was seventy-five. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Oh, uh, I want this one here. Okay, clear. Oh, uh, move this up. Oh, you know what? Let's do the standard error first. So eleven thousand five hundred. Oops, five hundred thirty-eight divided by the square root of 75. Then I want to do two times that. Then I want, so this can be, I'm going to call it M. Why? It's still my margin of error, right? And so here, this, is my margin of error. 
still. Then I can find 92,172 minus M and 92,172 plus M. And if I, oops, screenshot that, I can bring it in. Hopefully I didn't didn't uh, oops make a mistake there oops. crop uh, let's see here uh looks good I'm just double checking my my entry. Felt like my my keys were a little bit sticky. And by keys, I mean me pressing the the iPad. Okay, so looks okay. So then my interval is what? So I put them in round brackets. Uh, it's gonna go from six six four one three point. Four zero. Now this is money, so we're gonna round to two decimal places, right? And round properly up to one one seven nine three zero point six D cents. I'll put in little. No, I'll just leave it like that. Okay. So this is our our confidence interval. Now we have to interpret the confidence interval. Okay, let's see here. <clears throat> uh, it's been a while since we interpreted a confidence interval together. And so uh, what's the general layout? We're 95% confident, right? Because we made a 95% confidence interval. We're 95% confident that the interval from here to here captures, captures what? Now that's where we wanna to refer to the question and just reword the question as an answer. Captures the average debt of these companies at the time of filing. Notice it asks you to make a 95% a, a confidence interval for something, okay? And so your interpretation has to be about that something the average debt of these companies at the time of filing. All right. The interpretation, we are 95% confident the interval from 66,413, oops, $13 and 40 pennies to 117,930 and 60 pennies <clears throat> captures, right? You have to have that word captures in there. There's no better word, right? Because we know that the, the true population mean exists. We just don't know what it is, right? And so now we're saying I'm 95% confident that this interval captures it, okay? Captures the average debt of these companies at the time of filing. The average debt of these companies at the time of filing. Oops. Nice. Okay. Good. And perfect, perfect spacing too, because that's the end of one sample means. All right. So are we ready for, for two sample means? So now we're going to move into two samples. 
And so uh, that's the end of last day's material. It usually takes me a little bit longer. That's okay. We're going to do it all over again, sort of. So now we will consider two samples. Okay. But it's a special case of two samples. Okay. Um, if the observations are paired in the samples, then we have paired data. Okay. Now we will consider um, two samples. We will start with a special case where the observations in each sample are paired. Oops, in each sample are paired. <clears throat> Paired data. And this is 7.2. In 7.3, just so we have the lay of the land here, in 7.3, we're going to analyze two independent sample means. So that's where we, we move away from the special case, and now we just have two independent samples. So two independent sample means. So when you're reading a means question, right, then it's either one sample mean or two samples. And if you've decided it's two samples, then you have two options, right? So you have to determine if it's paired data or uh, two independent samples. Okay? And so today we're going to talk about paired data, which is kind of a fun, um, fun little, we do a, a sneaky trick. Okay, and we really don't change anything from uh, from the one sample means calculations. So we'll introduce it through an example. First, we need to understand these paired observations, right? That's going to be uh, the most important part is identifying paired data. And so if we have paired observations, then we have made... Um, then we have uh, each each uh, subject right has yielded two uh, pieces of information, so two two variables. And so here, for example, two hundred observations were randomly sampled from the high school and beyond survey. The same students took a reading and a writing test, and their scores are shown below. Okay, and so now each student has a reading score and a writing score. Okay. So at first glance, does there appear to be a difference between the average reading and the writing test score? Not really. There's a lot of overlap. There's more variability in the reading scores, but generally um, there's a lot of overlap. And so it doesn't look like there's that much difference. Okay. What's interesting, though, is we want some way to capture that, okay, if you are good at reading, then logic kind of dictates that you might be good at writing as well, and vice versa, right? If you're good at writing, then very likely you're good at reading. Or if you are a poor reader, right, so if you're scoring low on the reading test, you're likely, unfortunately, scoring low on the writing test as well. And so we need some, some analysis that captures that uh, the differences, right? And so uh, a student might have a high reading and writing score. And so, um, so we want to take that into account, right? And so <laughs> if we think about the data set, it might look something like this. And so um, 
if we have the scores, right? So we've got some student ID number, an observation number, that's not important, right? That's just for us to be able to refer to a line, right? And um, are the reading and writing scores of each student independent of each other? Well, looks like, okay, just like we said, okay, if you have a 57 in the reading score, then you get a 52 in the writing score and 44, which is lower, then you get a lower writing score. And so it looks to me like, uh, no, right? We suspect students with a high score in one category, in, uh, or maybe I'll say on one test, oops, on one test, will have a high score, oops, a high score on the other test as well. Huh? It's just got the answer on it. Okay. <laughs> If we have paired information, the way that we're going to capture that, okay, a student with a high score here is going to have a high score here, and a student with a low score is going to have a consistently low score, right, because we have paired data, uh, then what we do is we analyze the differences, okay? And so to analyze paired data, we look at the differences in each pair of observations, okay? Now, it doesn't matter how you calculate the difference. Um, so here, it's important that we always subtract using consistent order. And so for me, I always subtract the first one and then minus the second one because it's just easier to, to think about. Right, and so here, and that's what they've done, 57 minus 52 is five, right? 44 minus 33 is 11, and so on and so forth. And so now we have these differences, right? And these differences capture uh, the changes within each student, right? Between the reading and the writing score. So what we do now, right, now, Now, we have one sample of differences. Why is that a smiley face? That was a weird smiley face first time I fixed it. Um, why is that a smiley face? We know how to analyze uh, one sample uh, of numerical data already, right? The tricky part is that now we're analyzing the differences, right? So now we're analyzing the mean of the differences. And really what we're interested in is, okay, if there's no difference uh -huh, between each group, the difference here would be zero, right? And so overall, if there's no difference between the reading and the writing scores, then the mean difference should be zero, right? And so that's going to be our uh, the the base for our hypothesis test. Okay, and so the parameter of interest is the average difference between the reading and the writing scores of all high school students mu diff. So here we have a mu and a little diff here, uh, just to indicate that this is the differences. We have a point estimate, which is the average difference between the reading and the writing scores of the sampled high school students, which we denote by X bar diff. Okay. And I think I'm going to bring in uh, 
from the formula sheet. Look at us go. We're almost running out of formula sheet. Well, we're running out of term, but also we're running out of formula sheet. And look at us. Wow. Here, I'll bring it in first. Oh, uh, in here. Why did it jump to the top? Okay. So from the formula sheet, once you've identified that you have a paired data, or sometimes I call it matched pairs, just to emphasize that these are paired on each observation, right? And so whichever way you want to call it is fine. We're analyzing the mean difference. Okay? So a confidence interval for the mean of the differences is you take your point estimate, which is your sample mean of the differences, plus minus, and here, nothing really changes. It's a T star, so a critical value of T with N diff minus one degrees of freedom. So here, the degrees of freedom is N diff minus one. That's the number of differences, right? Because now you have one sample of differences. And so that can be confusing, I know, especially as you're starting out. But just, uh, just remember that we boiled it down now to one sample of differences. And so then our hypothesis, oh, sorry, we have a, a standard deviation of the differences and we can find, uh, and we have some number of differences, okay? So there's really nothing, there's nothing new here. This is the exact same as the one sample means, except we've just got the little diffs on here, right? And the difference is, haha, the change is, that our null hypothesis is how the mean difference relates to zero, right? So this is the only change from uh, the one sample mean scenario. In fact, it simplifies our T calculation, right? We have X bar of the differences minus zero, and then we have S of the differences over the root, square root of the N of the differences, right? And so besides, Besides all the subscript diffs, right? This is the same um, as a one sample mean. These formulas are the same as for one sample mean. Yeah. So, I just remembered something that I meant to bring up at the beginning of class, so let me just go there. Uh, Oops, not test one. I posted uh, here in week 10, which is this week, uh, I posted practice for test two. <coughs> I'll post the solutions. These are, this is long, okay? And so I'll post the solutions, but if you can do all these, then you'll be well prepared for, for the test, okay? And so um, I put uh, the topics for this test and I've decided to cut it after today. So after paired data, uh, that's going to be what's on test two. So even though our test two is next Thursday, it's a week from now, we'll cover new material on Tuesday, um, which I don't love doing, but uh, it just makes more sense for us. And so we'll cover new material on Tuesday and then that won't be on the test. And then, uh, so after today, you'll be all set to, um, with everything you need for test two. Okay. 
And so that's the practice for test two, right? Notice the, the four uh, because it's quite long and I, that's obviously not the length of the test. Okay. And then, yeah, just a, a reminder, a friendly reminder that test two, we moved it, right? We moved it to the 28th. So it's before the Easter long weekend. Okay. Good. Should have said that at the beginning, but. Not 100% today. Uh oh. Uh, where'd my screen go? Okay. Uh, weird. Share my screen. Weird. Now it's all. How did it all set up here? There. Weird. So let's talk about why the null hypothesis is comparing to zero. So if in fact there is no difference between the scores, which has to be our null hypothesis, the null hypothesis is one of no change. So between the scores on the reading and the writing exams, what would you expect the average difference to be? We would expect it to be zero. Okay. And so what we saw is that, um, oh, this is weird. Just ignore this. I don't know what that is. Weird. What are the hypotheses for testing if there's a difference between the average reading and writing scores? Then our null hypothesis, H naught, is going to be that mu diff is equal to zero. What's really, really nice about paired data is this will be your exact null hypothesis. Okay, so you don't need to make any changes. That is always your null hypothesis. And so this is always H naught for paired data. And the alternative as a default, if we want to know if there's a difference, a difference, means that I don't care if one is less than the other, right? Then I just, I care about both directions. And so I'm, I, it's the not equal to, right? And so this not equal to comes from the question. Now, because of how we calculate the differences, right? That's gonna determine if one is higher than the other, then the difference will be less than zero or greater than zero. That takes quite a bit of work. Okay, and so usually I tend to avoid that and I only tend to use a, a not equal to for paired data. Okay, uh, I might have one on an assignment where I make you do a less than or greater than because it requires some thinking, but not on the test. I won't do that. Okay. So what's really fun is that there is nothing new here, just like it says. So we've already done this analysis and <laughs> and we're testing to see if the average difference is different from zero. Oh, uh, let's just skip to the uh, the assumptions. Okay, and so we were told that the students were randomly sampled, and so that's good. It's less than 10% of all high school students, which I've said is optional, right? We can't have too much of the population. And so then we can assume that these uh, differences and the reading and the writing scores are independent. Uh, ba -ba -ba. No, the difference between the reading and the writing scores um, of one student in the sample is independent of another. So the students are independent of each other and that's all that matters. Paired data, right? You, you need your, your data to be not independent between, right? 
And let's see here. Oh, let's do, uh, let's do this. I'm going to add a page here. I'll just grab the question that we're trying to answer. Okay. So here, the observed average difference, okay, the observed average difference between the two scores is negative 0.545 points, and the standard deviation of the difference is 8.887 points. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jot down that information. So X bar of the differences. Now that diff is just a little subscript, just a little reminder, is negative 0.545. The standard deviation of the differences is 8.887. I think we had how many students? I want to say 200 or something. Let's see here. 200. So we have 200 differences, right? And so that's our N, is the 200 differences. So N diff is 200. Do these data provide convincing evidence of a difference between the average scores on the two exams? So now, as our first step one, state the hypotheses, From our formula sheet, we know that the null hypothesis for paired data is that mu diff is equal to zero. Okay. Our alternative hypothesis also has to be about how mu diff relates to zero. And we want to know if there's a difference, which means not equal to here. This makes it a two-sided test, right? Which means I need a two-sided p-value, right? And so here, I'll make it a two-sided test. That's just a reminder to myself when I need it later in step three. Okay. We should check the conditions here, but I'm skipping it because we already uh, talked about the independence condition, which we randomly sampled, so that's met. And also, uh, our sample size is larger than 30, so we can assume normality. Fine, I'll just write it down. I do that a lot. I say I'm not going to do something, and then I can't help myself. The conditions, independence, randomly sampled, so that's satisfies that, and then normality. N is 200, which is greater than 30, so we may assume normality. We also saw the histogram of the differences uh, earlier. We didn't talk about it, but it looks approximately normal. And so that's what it's checking. Okay. But because the sample size is large enough, uh, we can just go ahead and, and assume normality. Now we're ready for step two, which is uh, do the test. 
calculate the test statistic. Now the test st statistic is still a T because we're talking about means. And if you don't wanna put all the little diffs on here, then that's fine. How far is the sample mean of the differences from zero? taking into account the standard error of s diff over the square root of n diff. Negative 0.545, I think it was. Yep. How far is that from zero? Well, I don't need to write minus zero anymore. Uh, divided by 8.887, I think it is. Divided by the square root of 200. <laughs> okay. <sighs> T then, let's see. Let clear this. I have, uh, let's, I'll just do it on one line, negative 0 0.545 divided by, <clears throat> bracket 8.887 divided by the square root of 200 because I want to make sure that my my standard error the 8.887 divided by the square root of 200 is one thing in the new in the denominator so here done save bump this over Wait. So now we have a T. T is roughly negative 0.867. I need three decimal places at least to use um, the T table to three decimal places, but you can have more if you want. Okay. So now, Step three is find the p-value. Find the p-value. From this t, I suspect I'm not going to reject h naught, right? This is very close to zero, and uh, so it's a little bit below, but it's it's in that that realm of close enough to zero. So if we have to find the p-value, we're going to use the t-table. So I start off my, my blurb using the t-table with some degrees of freedom. With degrees of freedom equal to n diff minus 1, which is on your formula sheet, right, in case you forget, um, which is... 200 minus 1, which is 199. I know, we've already seen it, I know that 199 is not on the table, so I'm going to say by using, and then I'm going to see what's, what's closest. So go down here. Copy. And paste. Oops. Paste but using degrees of freedom equal to, I'm choosing between 80, 100, and 1,000, I have to use 100. Okay. So now I have this 100 here. That's my degrees of freedom. I can ignore everything else. And what I want to do now is I'm going to take my uh, the absolute value of t. Um, maybe I'll clarify here. We find that the absolute value of t equal to negative 0.867.
same setup as before, right? Going to be between two values. So I drop the negative and I try to place it somewhere here. It's somewhere between and here, right? So I jot those values down 0.845 and 1.042. So now I need to remind myself do I have a one sided or a two sided p value? Right, I had a two-sided test and that's way up here, right? Here, I have not equal to, so it's a two-sided test, which means I need a two-sided p-value. So the two-sided p-value is also between two values. In fact, it's going to be between 0 0.30, right, reading from right to left, because it's uh, the p-values are decreasing as you move further out. So the p-value is somewhere between 0 0.30 and 0 0.40. All right, here. Okay. Good. Now what? So now I have a range for my p-value. Of course, you can use software to find uh, the actual p-value, and it should fall somewhere in that range. Okay, step four is the conclusion. Conclusion is the same as always, right? Never changes. If the p-value is small enough, you have enough evidence to reject H0. And so what we say is, since our two-sided p-value is between, oops, between 0.30 and 0.40, right? That's not less than the alpha level, uh, any alpha level, but I think they told us to use alpha equals to 0.05, which is the default anyways. So which, or maybe not yet. Uh, since our two-sided p-value is between 0.3 and 0.4, it is not less than alpha equal to 0 0.05 which means we do not have enough evidence to reject H0. Which means we do not have enough evidence to reject H0. Huh? Good. <laughs> what does that mean in terms of the question? Well, we'll refer to the question itself here. Do these data provide convincing evidence of a difference between the average scores on the two exams? No, they don't. So I'll do this. Therefore, these data do not provide convincing evidence of a difference between the average scores on the two exams, period. Sneaky. Nice. If we used um, software, right, we would find that the p-value is 0.3854 or something similar at 199 degrees of freedom. We used 100. Shouldn't make a huge difference, but it'll make a, a small difference, okay, if you're trying it out. Um, but that is between 0.3 and 0.4, right? So that's good. Uh, let's see here. Uh... You can read this on your own. I find that it, it can be a little bit confusing. So read it, see if it helps. But uh, if it doesn't, just ignore it. So I don't want to do that. I want to do this one. 
Okay. Now, if we were to construct a 95% confidence interval for the average difference between these scores, would you expect this interval to include zero? So we just said there's not enough evidence to say that mu is anything, or the mean difference is anything but zero, right? It's essentially zero, close enough to zero. And so if you're making a confidence interval, then that interval should include zero, right? And so here, um, we can make the confidence interval. Let's do that here. I'll do that here. Uh, where is it? Add a page. It's on the next slide, but uh, we do expect it to include zero, right? Because if we have, uh, no, sorry, I want to just do the confidence interval first and then we can, I can show you. So a confidence interval for paired data is X bar diff plus T star where the degrees of freedom is N diff minus one times S diff divided by the square root of n diff. T star for a 95% confidence interval, T star at degrees of freedom equal to 100 from earlier, right? So I'm not gonna write out that whole thing for a 95% confidence interval, T star is, let's see here, we said 100 degrees of freedom and, oh, you know what? I can just copy this, copy. Sometimes it's handy and sometimes it's not. Hey, paste. Finally, I'll just put this on a fresh page here. Sorry, regrets. Zoom in. Oops. Oh, I should have checked it before I brought it in. I'll do this. Oops. I'll just tell you what it is. 1.9, let's just pretend we know. 1.984. Whee! 1.984. This wasn't very helpful, so I'm gonna delete it. Okay. Besides that, we have all the information that we need. So we have negative 0.545 plus minus 1.984 times 8.887 divided by the square root of 200. Okay. okay, let's see here. I have uh, 1.984 times 8.887, oops, 7, divided by the square root of 200, and that's my M again different question though but we just did this right and so now I want negative 0 0.54 oh, hey negative negative 0 0.545 minus m 
and then I need negative 0 0.545, whoops, plus m. Okay, gonna bring that in. Hopefully I didn't have a typo in there that I didn't catch. So our interval is between negative 1.79, let's just go to two decimal places, to 0 0.70. This is for the mean difference. Okay. A negative difference right, means that the last score is higher than the, the first score, and a positive difference means that the first score is higher than the second score, whatever the order was. So now the question is asking, if we have a number line here, and we're 95% confident that somewhere in this range, we have the true difference, the true mean difference. Right, so here it's that our 95% confidence interval. And of course, zero, if it's negative to positive, it has to cross zero, right? And so zero is in this interval. And so that's how we can use um, a confidence interval to test a hypothesis informally, right? If the null value is in the interval, then you don't have enough evidence to reject H0 because we're 95% confident that that's one of the possible things. Then the last thing we have to do is interpret this interval, just remembering that it's about the mean difference. Okay, And so we are 95% confident the interval from negative 1.79 to 0.70 captures the mean difference in the reading and writing scores. So here captures the average difference between the reading and the writing scores. But I'll say the mean because I like that better in this case. We're 95% confident the interval from negative 1.79 to 0 0.70 captures the mean difference in the reading and writing scores. Nice. And here, right, we're talking about the mean difference. Okay. And that's what's highlighted on your formula sheet. And so here I'll say test to up to and including here. Or maybe I just need to say up to here. Hypothesis test, confidence intervals. And using a confidence interval. And maybe I shouldn't say that here. I should say, should move this cut to the end of the slides. But this is the same thing that we just found. And then it's the next section. So next, next week, we're going to do a difference in two means, which is seven point three yeah. but it won't be on the test it'll be on the final uh, test okay we'll end it there if you have any questions let me know uh otherwise have a great weekend and i'll see you see you uh -huh, on tuesday stop this recording here